My name is Dean Rosenthal. I'm the Fisheries Division Administrator for the Nebraska Game and Parks Commission. Um, I've been with the agency for a number of years uh, in a variety of different positions. I'm a lifelong resident of Nebraska. And uh, so with that, I'll go ahead and get started. Um, I want to just kind of touch base on some of the different opportunities and stuff in Nebraska. Um, we have a variety of different aspects here that we can deal with. Maybe. Okay, sorry about that. Um, this was from July of 2020 during the pandemic at Lake McConaughey. So it wasn't overly crowded like it is a lot of times. Um, people were looking for any opportunity to get out and enjoy the resources that we have, get away. Uh, people were tired of being cooped up. And, you know, as we know, you know, whether it's a lake, reservoir, pond, stream, or marsh, water draws people. Uh, it can be for fishing, swimming, boating, camping, hunting, wildlife viewing, playing on the sandy beaches, or just relaxing. People require outdoor recreational opportunities. And like I said, I think the pandemic indicated or demonstrated that very, very clearly. We have a wide variety of opportunities for people with our state recreation areas. Um, our state recreation areas offer a lot of opportunities, whether it's for fishing. We have approximately 66% of our anglers utilize our park areas for fishing. Um, over 90% of our areas offer some kind of boating or fishing opportunities. So we have a variety of different opportunities. And we have a variety of areas across the state, whether it's man-made reservoirs and lakes, natural lakes and the sand hills, which are, uh, I would say, a real treasure for Nebraska. Some of our streams up in the sand hills offer opportunities. So we have a variety of opportunities. Um, if you look closely on this boat, you know, they're skiing, recreating that way. But if you look closely, there's a trolling motor on the front of that boat. So a lot of the motor boat acts, motor boats and stuff that are licensed in the state are dual purpose, uh, not only for fishing, but for family activities, for having fun uh, with tubing or skiing or whatever it may be. Um, Nebraska requires reg motorboats to be registered in the state. Non-motorized vehicles such as paddlecraft do not need to be registered. So we really don't have a definite number on those. There's approximately 63,300 registered open motorboats, but we register a lot of different kinds of boats. Uh, so a total of 80,500 roughly for the state that are registered within the state. Um, There's a total of a little over 11,000 registered personal watercraft. A lot of people enjoy these um, opportunities with these boats because they don't take up a lot of space. They can be pulled behind about any kind of vehicle. Uh, so they're easily transported. Uh, I can honestly say that, that probably not all anglers see them in a positive light, uh, but they do offer a lot of different people opportunities to enjoy and re recreate outside of the cities. Nebraska's, as you know, if you've been around the state and you've been out west, there's one thing about it, the wind blows. And there's a lot of days it's blowing a lot. So a lot of boating opportunities like at Lake McConaughey or the Calamus Reservoir um, are a lot of days you can't get on the water with a boat. But, you know, kiteboarding and things, sports like that, 
offer a tremendous opportunity and they have events, uh, tournaments and stuff like that at both of these lakes. So these are sorts of things that regardless of the weather in Nebraska, and as we all know, it changes quite regular. You know, I kind of remember last week uh, with the temperatures versus this week. So there's a lot of different opportunities and people, again, need to get out. Uh, most of our recreation areas offer swimming beaches. Again, it's providing opportunities on those cool or on those warm and hot days, uh, whether it's going out on the paddle craft, such as the paddle board there, or in tubes, swimming. It's an opportunity for kids and everybody to get out, cool down, enjoy those hot summer days. This is probably the number one growing opportunity across the state and across the nation. Um, paddle craft, like I said, there's, there's a lot of opportunities. Um, Nebraska has more miles of stream than any other state in the nation. Uh, that's somewhat disputed sometimes, depending on the number of streams that we have that are dry now but there's a lot of opportunity. We have 518 miles of river trails that are designated. Uh, our agency, the, this particular picture here is out at Kearney. Uh, we do offer a guide to developing water trails. It's on our website. It's something we offer to help people, cities, uh, organizations to develop water trails. I believe last uh, seminar was on some development up in the Kearney area. And uh, again, it's a popular thing. This water trail out by Kearney gets a tremendous amount of use. The way that it looked on the water trail development for up at Norfolk was going to offer a lot of opportunities. Kansas has developed one similar to that one. So there's lots of opportunities out there. Um, There's 197 miles of designated wild and scenic rivers in Nebraska on the Missouri River and Niobrara River. They offer opportunities for a lot of different types of fish or activity, recreational activities such as canoeing, kayaking, tubing. Tanking is a, one that's become very, very popular. It's kind of a relaxing way to float down the rivers. Um, I think that might be because it's a lot easier to carry the cooler along for uh, refreshments. Uh, so I think that's one of the reasons that tanking is, is really popular. Uh, some of our streams like Calamus and uh, the, the Loop Rivers and the Niobrara offer a lot of opportunities and beautiful scenery along the way. With the different types of boats and activities that we're seeing, we're taking and, and adding the picture on the left up there is our normal boat ramp uh, boating access. We've had to start adding in a separate area for kayaks. This one on the right here is actually an ADA uh, ramp for kayaks. They can go down the ramp with the wheelchair get off on the seat there next to the ramp. The kayak is on those rollers. They can easily get in and roll themselves off. And then when they're ready to leave, they can roll back up on and get out. And so it's an ADA accessible ramp. And these are becoming very, very popular. Um, they offer a lot of opportunities for various people and we have to manage some of these areas for conflicts around um, the boat ramps and stuff, the big motorboat access areas and a small kayak access are a lot different. And there can be conflicts because when you're backing a boat down, you may not see that person with the kayak standing down there at the boat ramp. 
So it's a safety thing and it's something we're looking at and we're developing. Um, if any of you have not been out to our Conestoga State Recreation Area, that is an area that we've gone in and developed uh, with a lot of amenities with boating, but also with angler access. And I'd highly recommend if you get the opportunity to go out there, see some of the neat things, some of the uh, different aspects that we've created in that area. Uh, according to uh, this Wallace J. Nichols, a marine biologist, the sight and sound of water can induce a flood of neurochemicals that promote wellness, increase blood flow to the brain and heart and promote relaxation. And I think we all know that if we've ever been around water or out on the water, sitting on the bank, whatever it may be. This is more an area that I'm more comfortable with, um, with the fishing aspect of it. But they've shown a series of studies showing that regular exposure to nature helps lower the people's level of cortisol, the hormone that causes stress. And fishing takes these health benefits up a notch. And that was determined June 17 of 2020. So it's good for your health. It's good for your mental well-being. Um, but there's different types of fishing, whether you're fishing from the bank with a child, whether you're wading out in a sandhill lake, whether you're fishing from a boat or fishing from the bank on one of our, our irrigation reservoirs. Um, we have a lot of opportunities in Nebraska for fishing, whether it's for just family fishing or white bass at Calamus Reservoir or a place like that, bluegill at one of our area lakes around Lincoln or crappie fishing. Uh, we have a tremendous smallmouth bass fishery at Lake McConaughey. There's trophy musky fishing, which Nebraska typically isn't thought of as a musky state. But uh, we have a trophy musky fishing opportunity at Merritt Reservoir, uh, Calamus Reservoir. So we have a lot of opportunities, trophy cat, channel cat fishing opportunities at the Calamus Reservoir, Merritt Reservoir, Box Butte Reservoir out in the Panhandle. We have opportunities for trophy flathead fishing, whether out of the Missouri River or out of Branch Stoke Lake. So there's lots of opportunities out there, uh, lots of chances for people to enjoy recreating in Nebraska. Um, if you get into the economics of it, uh, recreational boating and fishing, the number one con is the number one contributor to a $689 billion outdoor recreation economy that surpasses RVing hiking and several other outdoor recreational activities. In fact, the economic contribution from boating and fishing were up nearly 30% in 2020 as compared to 2019. And Chris is gonna get into some of this with his figures and numbers and stuff on permits, but our permit sales went through the roof on 2020. They went down a little bit in 2021, they're back up a little bit in 2022 here. One thing that drives a lot of our sales on permits, fishing permits, is the spring weather. And this year, one thing that's driving it from what I've seen is we had some really great ice fishing opportunities. And that brought in a lot of permit sales early. Last year, um, I guess it would have been in 2020, we had, no, 2021, we had a professional musky fisherman from Wisconsin come down and fish and film for a TV show on musky fishing at Merritt Reservoir. One of their comments at the end was the, angler, the people in Nebraska up there are friendlier than any place else they've gone, that it was a positive experience. It was an opportunity for not only musky, but trophy catfish, trophy walleye. And they just really, they fish all over the country, but it's one area they want to come back to and fish again because it's a tremendous opportunity. You know, so whether you're just at the lake enjoying fishing, boating, camping, hunting, 
or just out there enjoying time with the family and friends. Keep in mind that time outdoors is time well spent, but this is something that occurs most every year out at Lake McConaughey, Kites and Castles, and it's a very popular event, and there's lots of different sand sculptures and stuff that occur at this time. It's again, it's another thing that draws people. Uh, that uh, front range area of Colorado uh, seems to move to Nebraska at that time uh, and spend a lot of time at Lake McConaughey. Here's some figures that are a little bit old and they don't always match up with some of the other figures, but fishing, Hunting, fishing, wildlife viewing, our state parks uh, all offer a lot of economic benefit to the state of Nebraska. Uh, nationally, uh, you know, there's 1.6 trillion spent in outdoor recreation. So it's a tremendous opportunity. Uh, I think it's one of those things. This is out of Southwick, Southwick and Associates. Uh, it's a marketing firm. Uh, so it's one of those things where outdoor recreation, water is a major draw. It's a major draw for our streams. It's a major draw for our lakes and reservoirs. Um, keeping water in these areas is critical and it provides a lot of economic benefit, brings a lot of people to areas to enjoy the area. And I think it's one of those things where, as we know that the folks from Nebraska know, it's, it's a great place to come and it's a great place to enjoy the outdoor recreation. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to Chris and he's gonna get in depth in some of the numbers and stuff on this. Okay, so as Dean mentioned, I'm gonna be building off a little bit on some of these numbers that, we, that we've seen um, with some of our outdoor recreation. Now this slide here is from a master's student I worked with. Um, she just recently graduated, but she was looking at in 2019 recreational budgets. So how much time pe do people spend at least one day in a year here in Nebraska doing these different activities? And so you can see we've got everything from spectator sports all the way down to adventure sports and probably no surprise, people in Nebraska like to watch football and basketball and all those, right? Almost 65% of the population spent at least one day in 2019 doing that activity. <clears throat> the only thing that was more than that that I don't have shown here was watching TV. But you can see here, water-based recreation, right? That is in the, also in the, the 60%. They're at least one, or they spent at least 60% of the Nebraska population spent one day um, doing water-based recreation as, as Dean showed, right? And as we get farther down here, we have fishing, right? And that is down in the 30%. That doesn't mean that they necessarily fished in Nebraska, but they spent it in, um, at least one day in 2019 um, fishing in Nebraska or another state. So qu quite a, a sizable pot, or a number. So I don't know if you recognize this thing, um, but this came onto the scene in 2020 and really changed our lives in, in so many ways. Um, it was devastating in a lot of ways, but it was also an interesting thing to see how it shaped and changed recreation in the United States and across the world, right? And so we see things, we, travel was canceled or restricted. Um, this is both by government or just through social norms and standards. Um, canceled many competing activities, right? The number of activities that you could actually do was reduced down to a a few of zooming at your house, right? Not actually getting to go out and do a lot of things. Um, it changed our work schedules. Many of us worked for home. We had different hours. Um, some people lost their jobs, unfortunately. So it really changed the whole work structure. And then lastly, um, it disrupted gathering in large groups. So going back to that last slide, right? Those watching team sports and watching football and basketball, a lot of that was reduced in 2020. So how did the pandemic influence one type of hydrotourism? And uh, we're gonna co concentrate here on fishing in Nebraska. We, we saw that there was a lot of change and disruption in recreation and travel, but what happened to fishing in Nebraska? And fishing is a good 
spot to start looking at. One, because everyone 16 years old and older needs to buy a fishing permit. So if you want to engage in that activity, that you have to buy a permit. And it allows us, working with game and parks, to track how people participate. And we're assuming that if you buy a fishing permit, that you are engaging in that activity. It doesn't necessarily mean that 100%, but it is a good proxy for um, participation. And then, as Dean hit on some of these, that we have several different options in Nebraska as far as permits. You can get anywhere from a single day up to a lifetime permit. And they vary on prices that we have one day, three day, five days, one year, three year, five years, and then lifetime permits. In addition to that, there's some combos that go with hunting, right? So you can buy the combo fish hunt permit and those kind of things. And as I mentioned, being able to track customers and, and what they're buying gives us a pretty good idea of who, what, when, and where of fishing in Nebraska, right? It tells us how many people are doing that, where they're doing that, any sort of demographic information that we can gain from, from the database tells us um, who those people are or some characteristics of those people. So here are all of the zip codes um, that people participated in or bought a fishing permit in Nebraska. Uh, Nebraska permit. Anything blue and greater is a zip code that had at least one person since 2010. So you can really see, right, most of those are occurring here in the state, but you can also see we, we're getting a lot of yellows around those zip codes around neighboring states. But we've got spreads all the way up from Maine, to the Pacific Northwest, and down to the bottom of Texas. So Nebraska attracts a lot of people to come fish. <clears throat> And here are some of the, the trends on the total number of permits. So here, we, these are distinct individuals. So when, if you bought one permit or two permits, right, you were counted once in this, the distinct number of individuals. The top bar are residents. The bottom bar are non-residents. The gold is a daily permit. And the white is the annual permits. And here's the, the trends over time. You can see kind of stumbling along. There's 2019 when we did that first survey, and then there's that big bump up here in 2020. And as Dean mentioned, we do see a slight decrease in 2021, um, but it's still a pretty sizable number, larger than it was pre-pandemic. We see the same sort of thing up here among non-residents. The one big difference that you really see is that non-residents proportionally buy a lot more daily permits. Not necessarily that surprising. Um, people are coming here to visit and rather than buying the year permits. The interesting thing, though, and I think, Dean, you, you mentioned this number, right, is that we see a 27% and a 26% increase in numbers for both non-residents and residents during 2020, during when the, the pandemic really hit, right? Now, pay attention here, right? Here is the number of people. This is an order of magnitude larger. So this increase, this 27% increase, is over 40,000 new anglers that came to buy fishing permits in Nebraska during 2020. And to put that in context, highlighting that area there, put that in context, that is like our, four, our fifth largest city, everyone buying a permit in that city. That's tremendous. Right? When we're often thinking about trying to bring in new anglers, we're thinking about you know, 5% over 10 years, and we've got 25% in a single year. So tremendous um, purchasing of permits in 2020. So who were these people that, that bought those permits? Who are these new anglers that showed up in 2020? <clears throat> Now, when we talk about anglers or you talk about hunters, one of the, the terms we often use or you'll hear is R3. And it's a way that we can categorize people that are participating in, in wildlife-based recreation. So we define recruits as a brand new person, a person who has never purchased a permit before. That was the first time they've ever showed up. So in our case, looking at the database, a recruit was defined as somebody brand new since 2010. They had not bought a permit since then. Reactivated is a person that lapsed at least one year. So often we see that people don't buy permits every year, that they'll go a year or two without buying one. Um, but 
and so we defined reactivated in this case as at least lapsing one year. And then retained is the third R. And these are the people that buy permits every year. And as we define this, that it was just at looking at a one year window. So retained are those that bought permits also the year before. So when we look at these numbers here, we can divide who bought those permits in that year um, based off of these different designations, right? And so we'll first start here in 2019. Here's the percentage of the population. These add up to 100%. And so we had 142,000 um, anglers that bought an annual or greater permit um, and residents. We're going to just focus in on the, the residents here because we tend to see among non-residents a lot more churn, a lot more lapsing, right? Because it's not something that you do every year. It's when you go and visit. So for the rest of this talk, I'm primarily going to talk about these annuals and residents, just given the extent of how many there were. But this is going to be a proxy for all of the other permits that we talk about. So we see in 2019 was fairly typical of the past previous 10 years. 20% of those usually that, that we get in any given year are re reactivated. So those are the ones that come back after a couple of years. Then we've got 16% of the anglers during 2019 are brand new anglers have never showed up. And then generally 63% um, are those that, that bought the, the previous year, which is a pretty good number to, to keep up. Here it is in 2020 and 2021. And one of the things that you really notice is the increase here by 6% of reactivated. So this means that there are a greater proportion of those that had not, that had bought permits a while back, suddenly decided to start buying them again in 2020, an annual permit. We also see a a bit of a jump, a 5% increase in those for, that were recruited. Um, and the retained number didn't actually go down that much. It's just proportionally um, because these went up, this one had to go down. But here is that, right, that 35,000 increase of residents buying annual um, plus permits. Now, the following year, 2021, it did decrease a little bit. We saw a reduction in the number, um, but still higher than pre pandemic. And the numbers kind of drifted back down a little bit towards pre-pandemic, except for we kept, we got a bit more reactivated or kept some more reactivated, but our retained actually increased. So that indicates that those that, a chunk of those that came back in 2020 that from the reactivation or brand new, right, bought them again in 2021, the year after, not after the pandemic, but when maybe when things started settling down a little bit and we got a a little more used to the way things were going. Now, looking at some of the characteristics of these populations. So this is the percentage of females across these three years. So we get 29% approximately was before the pandemic. That jumped up a little bit to 31% or almost 32% during the pandemic as being female. Um, and then that dropped back down to 29.5. Um, so we do see a little bit different in whether these we're talking about dailies. Women tend to buy dailies more than, an, uh, than males. Males tend to buy annual permits, but the average between those two um, came out to be about 32% females. We did see a number or an increase in the number of females. Also looking at the age range, we, we don't see too much change in the percentage. So I, I created a break off at about 40 years of age. That, that's a fairly normal break if you're looking at age distributions of uh, anglers and hunters is, is separating out the, the groups. So in um, pre-pandemic, about 48% that went uh, greater than 40 years old in 2019, that decreased slightly in, um, in 2020, and then increased to 51% in 2021. So we the, generally, the population got a little bit younger in 2020, so we're getting younger people, but also kind of going into that a little deeper, females tended to be younger buying those permits, and we tended to get older males um, buying permits during this time, and it averaged out to about right there at the 48. Now, the one interesting, big interesting thing I think here is the proportion of people that had lapsed for more than three years. So 
This we had generally 56% pre pandemic um, had lapsed more than three years. This jumped up to 62%. So those people that came back in 2020 during the pandemic had not been fishing for a long time. And when we generally look at these databases and looking at how long a person kind of stays in, generally, if they're not buying a permit within five years, we count them as being dissociated, that they're no longer going to participate. So large chunk of these people during the pandemic actually came back um, to participate. And then this is the percent change here across zip codes of people buying permits. So the one thing it's probably hard to see from where you are, but the, the real point here is that most of them are green and more, right? That means that there was an increase, a proportional increase across the state in permits bought. So there really wasn't an east versus west division, pretty much consistent across the country or across the state. So broadly, there were no large shifts in the characteristics of those who were fishing across the pandemic, right? And these patterns do not tell us the why, right? And that gets very difficult. You can only count on looking at databases and permit sales to get so much information. It's limited to what Game and Parks collects during the permitting process, um, but it really doesn't fundamentally get down to why those things happen. But luckily, Game and Parks um, partnered with Recreational Boating and Fishing Foundation um, to conduct a survey on all of those new anglers that showed up. And they shared that data with me. There's, there's a report um, that was available. And they sent a survey asking and getting at some of the reasons why people decided to participate in 2020. Now, not surprisingly, the, the top motivations are the same reasons that people fish or hunt or spend time outdoors for any reason or recreate outdoors. Um, it's to be with family, it's to connect with friends, it's to connect with nature and to spend time outside. Those are the top reasons why people participate in recreation outside. Um, and this is consistent across fishing, duck hunting, big game hunting, all of those things are, are similar, including boating, all of those kind of things, being outside, connecting with friends and family. That still remained the most important activity or the, mo the important motivation to participate in those. The interesting thing that they mentioned, though, has to go back to this graph that I showed you at the beginning. How many of these things, if you look here on the y-axis, were shut down or closed because of the pandemic, right? All of those that had to do with groups, so you get things like spectator sports, cultural, museums shut down or people didn't want to go. Arts, photography could still be done with people. Um, gardening, more independent, team and family sports. A lot of those were canceled. Recreational sports canceled. Hiking, camping still went on. Wildlife viewing, fishing, biking, shooting, hunting, foraging, and adventure sports. So what we saw in people mentioned in this survey, and that we've seen in a couple other surveys that we've done looking at some different groups, was this recreational landscape was disrupted, right? And these popular activities that most people do were no longer doing. And what that did was create an opportunity and, and made being outside doing those um, activities that Dean mentioned more appealing, right? And so you could go outside and go boating, go kayaking, feel safe while the pandemic was occurring, um, including fishing. And that's what we saw. So uh, the COVID pandemic brought a record number of anglers um, to Nebraska, uh, as I've mentioned a couple times, right? This was very interesting. The, the number that came in was profound. This was something that we saw not just here in Nebraska, but it was pretty much countrywide. Um, most states saw a bump in their hunting and fishing sales during 2020. Um, primarily those that had lapsed are those that came back, right? So this was an interesting, um, opportunity for those people that had kind of dropped out and not been able to experience hunting and fishing or fishing in a while to come back because that cultural landscape shifted and provided those opportunities. And then the other great news that is good for looking and thinking about um, 
funding, right? Sport fish and wildlife restoration dollars are generated based off of um, uh, equipment sales of, of, of hunting and fishing equipment, but also tied to license sales. So increasing the number of anglers, increasing the number of hunters that are there brings more money um, and resources for game and parks to conduct the, the important management. Um, many of these reasons why were similar to previous years, right? The, the reasons why people participated in the pandemic were very similar to the reasons why they normally want to do it. The, the big change was the disruption of other activities that made hunting and fishing that maybe doesn't get the same um, top shelf priority um, during other years when those other activities were suddenly made available to them. And people really flocked and took to those opportunities that Game and Parks provides um, and, and really um, visited and, and took advantage of that recreation. And the, the, the other good thing tying to this is, right, is that the surveys that went out to people, they didn't say the pandemic made me do it, right? That's, you don't want to be a management agency and counting on pandemics to bring in new people, right? But it did provide the opportunity that identifying that the same reasons they always do it are the same reasons that they came back, or, or especially the reasons came back, allows you to help develop some more marketing things and showing the images like, like Dean showed and really trying to appeal to people to get them to keep participating in these activities. And with that, um, this research was supported by several um, sport fish and wildlife restoration dollars administered through Game and Parks. Um, there's my contact information in our website if anyone has any uh, questions later on. Thank you. Um, what do you guys see as kind of the future for engaging more of these folks um, as they start to have competing activities you know, we see some of them are coming back. Are there, way, are there other things we can do to keep them coming back? I think there's a number of things that we can probably look at. Uh, one of the things I think is the experience they had, making it a positive experience, uh, being able to make improvements to some of our areas through our aquatic habitat program, uh, like we did at Conestoga. It makes it more family friendly. Uh, as Chris pointed out, there were more women involved, making those areas family friendly, more safe for people, that safe feeling, I think, are going to do, go a long ways in uh, increasing that opportunity to maintain those people. Yeah, I, I agree with everything Dean said. I think keep trying to hit on and, and appealing to why people are participating in it trying your best to connect why they did it during that year and the fun that they had going back to, you know, the, the lowering the, the stress levels and the cortisol levels that, that Dean mentioned, right? Highlighting how that all came to play during something as stressful as the pandemic, I think could help hold on to some of these people. Or do you just want the, do you just want the mic maybe? Here. Yeah, one last step. Um, Brandon on Zoom asked, did the camping reservation system have a negative impact on numbers at Lake Mac? Actually, uh, it, it didn't have a negative impact. The numbers were pretty similar to what they were in the past. The, the only caveat to that is they were not collecting actual information all the time to know exactly how many were out there camping. Uh, the whole point of that was to make it a safer environment. Uh, from comments that I've had from other people working for the agency, they really couldn't see a major difference in the appearance as far as the number of people, but it was a little more controlled. And uh, I think it, in the end, I think getting the word out and moving forward, I think it's going to be a much better environment, uh, a more enjoyable family-friendly environment for camping than what it was in the past. Other questions? I will point out that one thing that Chris didn't mention on the numbers and stuff is 
during 2020 and 2021, we have seen an increase in the number of three and five year permits sold compared to previous years. Uh, those, both of those have went up. Those are people that we will retain, have a much better chance of retaining. So people were starting to look long-term. This is something I wanna to continue to do. Very good. Chris, in that slide that you had, um, the different percentages uh, and the different types of activities, the very bottom one, I personally found that kind of surprising, the adventure sports, and it was like really meager. Yeah, I was. And I, you know, you see skate parks and dirt bike enthusiasts. And uh, I guess my question there is what all goes into an uh, adventure sport? What are the different, what are those? You right. Know? And so I don't remember exactly what all of them are, but it was things like rock climbing, uh, mountain biking was its own separate biking. Um, can't remember all of them. But there were several of them. We asked them actually individual activities and then we lumped them into this adventure sport activities. Um, so it could have had to do somewhat on how we parsed that out among some of the different activities. And also I think at least I know there's not probably not too many old guys like me skateboarding anymore. Um, and the survey went out to, you know, adults 19 and older in Nebraska. So we probably missed a bunch of those younger people that actually can bounce back from those activities when they fall down. <laughs> That's a good question. That, that, that thesis was all uh, revolved around foraging and why people engage in foraging in Nebraska in particular and looking at how foraging for, for berries and fruits and all of those kind of things fit into the rectual, uh, recreational landscape there. I have a question if no one else has one. So have you seen ways to, um, you know, so people get engaged in maybe one activity during the pandemic. Um, have you seen ways to kind of have that spill over into some of those other categories or, you know, take the experiences they had in one place and, I don't know, tournament is super users of, of outdoor recreation. <laughs> so we've looked at that not inside a pandemic. Mm -hmm. So we, it's something that we've looked at called cross buying. So the, mm -hmm. the, the likelihood that if you buy this permit, you buy some other permit. Mm -hmm. And interestingly, fishing, we see little cross buying. So if you engage in, and this is just within hunting and fishing, because mm -hmm. that's where we have the database to look at. We see very little, if you're an angler, you tend to not become a hunter. Mm -hmm. And if you're a hunter, you don't tend to become an angler. There's very little switch. There are people that if you become one of those combo people doing it already, you stay that way. But there's very little transition mm -hmm. among those activities, which is interesting because often when we think about hunting and fishing, fishing is counted as the, the gateway sport, mm -hmm. right? Or the gateway activity. And, and, and at least in Nebraska, we've seen very little in that transition mm -hmm. uh, among 19 and older adults. Mm -hmm. one, one thing about that is access and availability mm -hmm. uh, to areas to recreate. Uh, we have a lot of public access areas for fishing and we have a lot of public lands for hunting, but it's somewhat limited because they get tend to get crowded at times. So that may be part of it too, is we do have a tremendous opportunity, whether it's within the cities, with the city lakes and ponds, or the NRD lakes, or some of our areas, uh, some of the rivers and streams on private land. Uh, that may be part of it, but uh, like Chris said, it's, it's just not a lot of crossover a lot of times. Um, oh, it's loud. <laughs> um, for like advertising and getting the word out for all the different activities, do you see that most of that is like by word of mouth or how do you guys go about 
um, getting people involved and like what groups or age groups do you usually direct advertisements towards? We've uh, surveyed that a number of times uh, through our angler, licensed angler survey as far as how people get the information. Uh, it's changed over time as uh, technology has changed. Initially, it was through our, our fishing guide, uh, our boating guide, uh, through bait shops, but now, and word of mouth, and, but now a lot of social media, depending on the age group, whether it's Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, you know, we, we hit all the various social media platforms. And uh, I think that's probably becoming more of a trend, you know, as, as people, uh, as times change, less people are reading print newspapers and getting their news online or, you know, in other arenas. And so that, that's probably more of it is the social media at this point for all ages. Got a good question from a core online. Is there a limit to the number of fishing permits issued annually considering the possibility of overfishing? Uh, no. Um, anglers have a tendency to move from water body to water body depending on the popularity and the popular fish populations in those areas. So if a lake happens to be very good fishing for a particular species, anglers have a tendency to hit it hard and then move on to another area. So there's really not a limiting factor on the number of permits. Uh, it's when you consider the number of different water bodies we have across the state, the total amount of water we have uh, in the various lakes and stuff with new reservoirs being built in the Papio, Missouri, NRD area. I really don't see that as an issue. Uh, we control more of that through regulation with bag limits, size limits, things like that. The only exception is paddlefish. The, the paddlefish is an exception. That's managed on a, uh, a basin-wide uh, structure to work we combined with South Dakota to issue a limited number of paddle fish tags. Uh, South Dakota issues the same number we do, and that's limited based on the water basin, the Missouri River water basin there. Thanks. Zoom is blowing up right now. <laughs> do you track the number of violations issued during the year, um, including no license, no park permit, over limit, et cetera? Our law enforcement division monitors that very, very closely. Um, I don't have those figures, but uh, our law enforcement division uh, has pretty much everything uh, monitored on a case by case basis, whether it may be no fishing permit violation or no park permit. Uh, they, they get into all the different violations and uh, it's monitored very, very closely. They have a tremendous database that keeps track of that. Oh, oh we've got another question here in the back. I'm curious on your new people that fish, are they mostly catch and releasers or are they eating their catch? So I'm trying to think to the survey. I don't think we asked much on that one about um, whether they're harvesting or not. Generally, we've been seeing long-term across um, Nebraska, but across the country as well, a shift to more catch and release type fishing. It does depend on the species that you're going for. Um, it really started with largemouth bass, but it has trickled down into trout and things like that. Whereas um, maybe some of the trophy species as well, the flathead trophies, it's more catch and release. Um, whereas catfish, you do get more harvesting. Or harvest. Panfish, you get more harvest. Yeah, and, and uh, like Chris said, it kind of depends on the species. A lot of people will harvest walleye because of the palatability of walleye, uh, the yellow perch. Uh, 
our hard water anglers, our ice fishermen probably are more uh, harvest oriented than some of our open water anglers. Uh, again, like Chris said, the, the anglers that are tournament anglers, bass anglers, and that are strictly, for the most part, no harvest. And I think as people age, that age group is moving out that is strong harvest and the younger people coming in probably are less likely to harvest than some of the older anglers. Armando asked, with more anglers, is there more concern of invasive species or water quality degradation? There, there is a concern on more uh, invasive species issues, uh, especially with the increased boating and movement of boats from water body to water body. Uh, we have a tremendous uh, education program of clean, drain, dry on that. Uh, the water pollution, probably not so much. It's probably more dealing with watersheds and what goes on in those watersheds. The amount of phosphorus coming in is the main issue with some of the the algae and stuff that uh, we we've seen occurring. Other thought, yeah, we have a little bit of time for more questions. So here's another one. Um, just to bounce off of the issue of invasive species, I know some states have like check stations to investigate, um, you know, making sure everything's clean, dry and expect, inspected. Um, are you, I don't really know Nebraska's policy on that. Do you have those? And if so, are you implementing more due to more anglers and boaters? We, we don't have as such check stations. We do have uh, our aquatic invasive species clerks that go out and do uh, boat inspections at different boat ramps. We monitor like at uh, fishing tournaments, things like that, where we're getting a lot of people in from other states. Uh, we try and station those people in areas where we see our most risk uh, happening in those areas. Um, we do have zebra mussels uh, in the Missouri River system, Lewis and Clark Lake. Um, so it's an issue. We've been very, very fortunate as far as the spread of aquatic invasive species. And uh, so it's, we don't have the dollars invested like some of the Western states do. Um, we're dealing in the hundreds of thousands versus millions that uh, some of the Western states have invested and Wyoming and Colorado in particular. And there's the out of state stamp. Yes, we do have an out of state uh, boat stamp that ang or boaters are required to, to purchase to help fund some of this. And we are starting to see better compliance on that as we move forward. We, yep, we got time for one more. Uh, I appreciate uh, just the focus on this. And that, so how, so there, there's this big movement towards recreation outdoor. How do we capture it? How do we move it forward? You talk of all this economic development, but I don't hear it on, an, on a state level. I don't hear our governor talking about, hey, this is what Nebraska has to offer. How do we change this conversation? You know, that's something that, you know, changes as time goes, uh, getting more people involved, uh, getting more people behind it than what we've had in the past. Uh, if you go back to a long time ago, if in my standard, uh, back in uh, when we had a good upland game po population in the state, uh, it was a major draw to a lot of our small communities. And, you know, we don't see that so much anymore. You don't have those opening morning breakfasts going on. Uh, angling has always been popular because it's an outdoor activity. We didn't have a lot of competing activities going on. And how we get more support through the state government agency. I'm not really sure other than I think we're starting to see a little bit of it. I think the uh, Star Wars 
uh, legislation is kind of an indication of that with their focus on bringing people and, and improving the economy in those areas like Knox County and uh, the Lower Platte and Keith County. They're looking at recreation. They're looking at marinas. They're looking at a lake. They're looking at boat ramps. They're looking at those sorts of things because they're seeing that's where the opportunity is for drawing people into areas and improving the, the economy in those small communities and stuff. Let's thank both of our speakers.